Femke Herregave is a designer and researcher. That's also what is mentioned in the little booklet with the exhibition. Um, and she is looking at all kinds of mechanisms that are inside and deeply sometimes hidden in the realms of global finances, geopolitics, network powers, and the, the lot. In um, 2013, she was awarded the Young Designer Award, and that was for her work, Taxodus. And when I got curious, I uh, found on the internet and by the world to draait door a little interview. It was three minutes, three and a half minutes uh, with Femke. So that's the amount of time you get at uh, v, v, D, V, D, D. But nevertheless, it was very nice. And um, uh, Taxodus is also going to be explained uh, by Femke a little bit more. Um, consider yourself a multinational, which will not be very hard. Um, who avoids paying taxes as much as possible. But more I'm not going to say about this. Femke is not only working um, as an internet artist or web artist or working or designing games, it's far larger than that, but she will explain herself. And uh, earlier already I mentioned the book by Shani Orgat. I thought, let's bring it, uh, so I have something tangible in my hands. Media representation and the global imagination. Uh, I also looked at the internet and there was also a presentation by you, where you gave um, a t with the presentation of the book and you were also interviewed. And it was very nice to, to, to see. Um, Shani Orgat is, the, uh, is a senior lecturer at the Department of Media and Communication uh, at the London School of Economics. Usually it's always abbreviated L LSE, um, but it's also political science. And um, we had a brief, very brief exchange, and, and Shani said, well, of course, I'm not an art historian, but we didn't invite her to speak about um, art, but reflect upon um, what images and, and text and, and the dissemination through internet actually does. So it's about media representation in a global world, uh, the interplay between media representation and global imagination. And uh, there is referred to mediated intimacies, for instance, and um, the social power of the imagination. And these are all concepts that Shani works on. I think it just goes to show our dependence on the visual to imagine. Yeah. Because at some point I thought, well, maybe I'll go without it. Yeah. But how can we imagine? Um, without the image. So thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here and it's a great honor. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I, um, I'm very conscious that my slides are rather visually impoverished and it might be because part of what I want to suggest is that media imagination is impoverished vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kind of imagination that uh, art can enable. But it's not that optimistic. I'm hoping to also suggest some ways that media uh, can nourish imagination in productive ways. So my talk, as um, Kitty has kindly introduced it uh, before, my talk is based on my book, uh, Media Representation and Global Imagination, which really originated for me um, from the broad question that animates my work. Uh, it's a huge question. It's a, it's a question about how we imagine the world we live in. And more specifically, how do we imagine our relations to others, whoever these others are in this world, and how these imaginings um, shape our own experiences and public life. I, I'd like to comment on the notion of imagination that obviously is in the title of this symposium, um, because we often tend to think uh, about imagination as the capacity um, it is the capacity to form mental images and concepts for something that is absent, yeah? And we tend to think about it often as a personal, uh, very private and creative faculty. We say about artists, what an imaginative artist. We often talk about children, what, is a, what an imaginative little girl. Um, but imagination does not uh, emerge fully fledged. It doesn't, uh, the myth is that imagination kind of bursts um, um, with some, some spontaneous burst in. Imagination must be nourished. Um, this is the starting point for me to um, acknowledge, although we might be reluctant, that the media, and by media I mean television and newspaper, traditional media, but increasingly also social media and new media, the media are fundamental resources that feed our imagination today of the world. 
Um, and this is why I've uh, um, selected this actually artist image, uh, this graffiti image uh, of an artist uh, whose uh, artistic name is No Hope, no as in to no hope rather than no hope, um, of this, um, um, of the embrace of the old television with the screen, the blurred screen, but the screen that is on. Um, and it's interesting because when my publisher, just as an anecdote with my publisher, um, sent me the first version of the cover before I've asked for it, I, he had one of those images that Mario Lang showed before, you know, this kind of globe, and I said, no way. <laughs> um, um, and so media representations feed and shape how we imagine ourselves and others and how we think and feel about the world we live in. And I, in my talk today and in my book at more length, I treat uh, media images, narratives, voices as invitations to us to imagine um, ourselves and others in a world that's characterized by rapid processes of globalization. So how does the world appear on our screens today, on our smartphone screens or on big screens? How do media representations uh, and what do they tell us about the world? And crucially, what remains invisible? What's not on the screen? Um, and what and who are excluded from these representations? And what truth claims, in the Foucauldian says, these exclusions produce? These are the big questions, very huge, that I'm, I try to address in the book. And today, I'd like to very briefly address them by looking at two examples of media representations. And these I'm using just to tease out some broader reflections about how we are called on today as uh, publics and as individuals to imagine the world. So the first example is rather banal, um, and um, in a few months' time, we will all be witnessing it yet again. And this is the New Year celebration that's so familiar. Every 31st of December, on each year, these representations of the Christian uh, ushering of the New Year follow a fairly similar, quite conventional, you might say boring, uh, formula. This montage of clips of scenes from various cities around the world but they organized into a narrative of people around the world, and we are told by the narrator, in cities all over the world, people are celebrating and welcoming the new year. And the visual narrative commonly um, starts with Sydney in Australia, where the new year uh, arrives first, and followed by images from uh, scenes of celebrations from other global cities, towards large cities like London, Paris, Berlin, Tokyo, Moscow, New York, and so on. Now, there's a consistent um, set of specific visual tropes that include these outdoor scenes and famous touristic public uh, spaces, firework the place, the displays, showers of confetti, crowds, people embracing, dancing, and laughing. And the visual focus on these celebrating crowds generates <coughs> this sense of togetherness. And I want to suggest that a very important trope in the imagining of the world that we're being offered by the media today is this, if, if you wish, even as some kind of a nostalgia for this embodied uh, participation in public life, people gathering in the city together to share and express the same emotions of hope, of excitement, um, through a public ritual of celebration. Now, not only does it appear that all the citizens in all the countries of the world are doing precisely the same thing, they participate in this highly orchestrated celebration, the celebrations themselves in those different countries are so similar as if there was this global director somehow, yeah, that measured and orchestrated them in the very same way. So it appears almost, and this really links back to this fiction that Monica was talking about in the morning, it, it, it appears almost as if the separate crowds in these places were all part of one unified space, the world. Um, and so the most immediate level, the message today about this globe is of similarity and of sameness. Cities and countries around the world are joined together in a single story centered on a common event. And the skies are lit up by fireworks and they look pretty much um, the same. They are placeless, yeah? Because they're, 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 they diffuse any of the specificities of what happens beneath these skies. And all cities, importantly, and this links partly to Femke's point, all cities are marked by enormity and grandeur. Large-scale, spectacular celebrations, very tall monuments, touristic attractions. So the event of the New Year, if you wish, 
for me, is just an, 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 an instance of a representation that acts as the symbolic glue that enables these various cities across the world, supposedly, to be brought into this fiction that, that Osborne reflects on of a single space um, um, and helps sustain this utopia of this globe that is a singular thing. And it seems a very inclusive imaginary. Yeah, because again, people of all the and countries all over the world are taking place in this ritual. However, this imaginary of the world is decidedly urban, yeah, and it's decidedly national. The majority of the images of our cities capitalizing on the touristic imaginaries and the manufactured desirability of um, these spaces, so the skyline, you know, the Big Ben of London, St. Petersburg Cathedral, um, Times Square in New York, and so on. There are no images of rural scenes. Each city acts as a metonym for its country, so Times Square standing for America, London for Britain, and so on. Stateless nations are excluded from this imaginary of the world. Now, at the same time, while this is a very strong myth that is being perpetuated through, through representations, at the same, same time, these very representations, the logic that organizes them is fundamentally comparative and importantly competitive. The montage of these numerous images of the same event of far-flung places inherently foregrounds the differences between them. And crucially, these differences are evaluated and hierarchized by a very specific criteria, and the criteria is from Femke's presentation. It's about money. It's, and, and, and oftentimes in these um, um, news reports, but also in a lot of social media stuff that I've looked, so I, I looked at the kind of traditional reports of the main news channels, but also at what, what, what people post online from their own celebrations. What is repetitive there is the expenditure of the fireworks, which is cited as the very measure of the overall success of each country to compete to perform in this globe, yeah? Um, so each country's celebration acts as a metaphor for its economic resilience and competitiveness. Size, spectacle, grandeur are the symbolic benchmarks for comparisons that determine the positions of these cities and countries on this global map. Now, accordingly, of course, economic weakness, disorder, conflict, we talked about frictions in the morning, are completely suppressed. They're smoothened out from these um, representations. Developing countries, or the entire continent of Africa for that matter, is completely absent from the world in this celebration. Um, so is the majority of Asia, and those uh, cities that are allowed in, like Rio de Janeiro or Beijing, are allowed in this imagination of the world only because they are shown to be rising economic powers, and they're, of course, represented in a highly orientalizing manner. But Africa is not even at the hierarchy of these worlds. It's just absent altogether. Yeah? And again, it's just one instance, but it's a very um, um, significant uh, pattern of how daily we are asked and called on to imagine the world. Now, the spectacular qualities of this event and its positive connotations of excitement, of festivity, of collectiveness and hope, what they do is they aestheticize and they sublimate, sublimate the less positive and rather brutal meanings of economic competition. The story of countries and cities struggling for survival, yeah? The majority of the cities were struggling for survival, let alone the, the, their recognition or success in such extremely volatile financial times. All this is told through the spectacular scenes of fireworks and rejoicing crowds celebrating in a very selective collection of the world's famous venues. And one of the things that seemed to me very um, disturbing personally, and again, uh, in mainstream media representations, but increasingly, despite a lot of the celebration of social media as ushering some kind of counter narratives, a lot of what research consistently shows is how much of the ways in which the representation of the world on social media mirror the representation in mass media. What is missing in this imagining 
or what it's not interested is in showing what um, geographer David Harvey calls the geography of social distress. Yeah? This is a geography that is missed out in these representations. The world appears as a fiercely competitive and prosperous playing field. The negative and the often brutal implications of privileging economic successes are obscured. Low-income people living in these cities, working over the period of the new year, often doing extra work to make ends meet and to survive life in the city, these are completely absent. So the global imagination, when we talk about global imagination, in my mind, one of the fundamental thing to bear in mind and to ask is to, that it's as much about who and what we do not see as whom we are allowed to see. Yeah? And this leads me to my second example, which develops this tension between visibility and invisibility as a very central tension to global <coughs> imagination and to ways of representing that feed this global imagination. And this is very timely because there's been recently an upsurge in migrants' representation in the public media realm. And here in Europe, we daily um, hear constantly about the so-called migrant crisis. You know, I have a lot to say about framing it as a crisis, but it's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it aside. And so daily uh, images of refugees fleeing uh, on inflated boats, uh, Syria, Afghanistan, and other countries seeking a better life in Europe are shown. And I do um, believe that there is a real potential in such images and also in social media enabling. There's uh, growing stories and images that refugees themselves produce through art, but through also um, on online. These images can or have the potential to reshape how we imagine the world and its others. To encourage questioning this dominant imaginary of the world as this prosperous playing field and to puncture, I really believe in the kind of element, the, 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 the subversive element of puncturing the spectacular image of the world that's made up of thriving cities with skies lit by firework. So imagery, um, both of the kind of mediated images of representation and self-representations, open up at least a possibility for the geography of social distress to shape or reshape our cartographic imaginations. And there's a striking example that I'd like to give, which is actually from a very relatively um, old film. It's a 2002 film. And it's an example of precisely this, if you wish, alternative imaginary of the world. It's the wonderful uh, film called Dirty Pretty Things, which, again, was made in 2002, but is extremely timely and apt. Now, the film provides... Anyone has seen it here, by the way? Oh, wow, that's the first uh, audience. That I, that's great. So, because um, usually people have just haven't heard about it. So the film uh, provides a really gritty depiction of the exploitation of illegal migrants in London, yeah? And it's centered on Okwe, who's on the left, who's a Nigerian illegal migrant in London, who works as a hotel porter by day and a minicab driver by night. And um, Tanai, next to him, she's a young Turkish woman also illegal, and she earns pittance. She works in a maid in the same hotel that Okwe works. One morning, Okwe is instructed to clean up uh, one of the rooms of a guest who stayed here there overnight with a prostitute. And he has to unblock a toilet pan which is overflowing with blood. And he finds that the obstruction, what obstructs the toilet, is a human heart. It's a very uh, symbolic and uh, charged moment in the movie. And this discovery leads Okwe and Senai to become embroiled in the underground illegal trade in uh, human organs uh, in London. And the film really reveals the sinister network of control that relies on keeping asylum seekers and migrants that are desperate to obtain EU passport in this state of servility and fear. Now, in a scene um, in an underground park, Okwe delivers a box containing human organs 
to one of the white native Englishmen who are in, who's involved in the trade. And the guy, the English guy, tells him, how, how come I've never seen you before? You know, usually there's another guy coming delivering me the organs. How, how come I've never seen you? And in a calm, quiet tone, Okwe replies, we are the people you don't see. We are the ones who drive your cabs, clean your homes, and suck your cocks. Okwe's poignant response raises the fundamental question with which I'd like to conclude. And if this is not provocation, tell me what is. <laughs> who do we see and who do we fail to see in the contemporary representations of the world? And I'm not simply calling for making the invisible visible. There's many platforms now that are celebrated precisely for allowing marginalized group and impoverished group to represent themselves. And in the book, I explore it through the theme of intimacy at a distance. We, we are invited to, to be intimate of far away others that we would have never met without these mediated representations. But their visibility does not guarantee that they are seen. Yeah? And after all, we see now daily migrants and refugees on our screens, in the newspapers, on the internet. But as Okwe observes, we do not see them. They are often strangers who are so morally removed from us that they have no status, no meaning for us. And to me, it seems that so long as the new year imaginary prevails, yeah, by which the only measure for one's worth, and be it a city or a country or individual, if the only worth, if the dominant narrative is that one's own value is economic competitiveness, how can we let into our imagination those who are unable to compete? Yeah? How can we admit a different imaginary, an imaginary that recognizes and values, rather than just ignores or pities, the precarious lives of the millions living under the firework-lit skies? Thank you.